have uh, the great Brock Pierce coming on with us. Brock is, of course, an entrepreneur and investor. You uh, may know him as uh, he was, of course, also a child actor from going back to the Mighty Ducks. But you may know him from uh, being one of the co-founders of, uh, of Tether, for example. But he was also a former chairman of the uh, Bitcoin Foundation, senior advisor to the UN, futurist, philanthropist, economist, creator, at this point, Brock's got one of those uh, resumes that, that you can only really hit the highlights in an introduction like this. But hopefully, uh, everyone's already familiar with who he is. Let's go ahead and get Brock out here. He is a great place to start asking about Bitcoin itself. Good morning, Mr. Pierce. How are you, sir? Well, good morning. And uh, I enjoyed that last segment. Uh, obviously, it's the it's the main topic of today. Yeah, uh, what's absolutely. What's going on with ETFs? And I, and I think, you know, the results are exactly what we are used to seeing, which is, you know, trade on the, the buy on the hype, you know, sell on the results. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin got a big lift leading up to the uh, uh, to the ETFs going live. And it should not come as a surprise that uh, the market would drop. It's been 15 percent. Obviously, the big hit. I don't know if I was here early enough. It was the the impact it had on the Bitcoin stocks. You know, the biggest mm -hmm. impact here is the Bitcoin mining stocks were your ETF equivalent uh, for mm -hmm. the public markets. And so there has been a public angle or play, and those stocks have been hit by more like 30, 40 percent uh, relative to the 15 percent drop in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I've, I've had the pleasure of interviewing you probably about a dozen times now over the over the past uh, seven years or something. Uh, I really take you to be someone who just loves Bitcoin, loves, uh, you know, the the notion behind it, the idea of a decentralized uh, digital currency independent of state. I know that that's an idea that's near and dear to your heart. You've spoken to uh, El Salvador and other countries that are looking to adopt Bitcoin and so forth. You know, um, having sort of an, an, an emotional investment in watching this gigantic global project unfold, you know, what do you see the advent of ETFs doing to our beloved Bitcoin at this point? Everyone's hoping that the answer is make it extraordinarily valuable. That, that that's, that's what people would like to hear. But, you know, overall, what, what do you think the effects are going to be? Because in a way, I also see this as a situation where we're going to have to share in a way that we're not used to. People who don't have digital wallets are going to be are going to be buying exposure to Bitcoin through these ETFs. So it'll change the playing field a little bit. I think it's a great thing. Um, price aside, like the price movement isn't what gets me excited. You know, price right. is just the primary barometer of sentiment, right? Mm -hmm. Sentiment goes up, sentiment Absolutely. goes down. It's all sorts of emotional sort of things, you know, that, that, that drive that. What it's ultimately creating is a more resilient Bitcoin. And mm -hmm. a more resilient Bitcoin is a good thing because now the SEC has approved these public ETFs where, you know, it's we're becoming institutionalized. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Once you're 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 an asset class that's held on the largest balance sheets in the world by the most prestigious financial institutions in the world. And the Securities and Exchange Commission has permitted this. The idea of government intervention to you know, call it go to war with Bitcoin has been substan substantially decreased as a result of this event. So I'd say mm -hmm. in the in in the the giant war of freedom and people having access to this alternative asset class uh, that they believe in, uh, this was a huge victory uh, for for the people and for Bitcoin. In that, uh, it's hard to roll this one back. This one, uh, mm -hmm. uh, this one is kind of, you know, arguably like a, a BCAD almost sort of event. It's <laughs> We're blessed and after blessed, like we were all these pioneers, piratey, you know, kind of fringe group, you know, that we're talking about Bitcoin to like, you know, we've we've been blessed by the authority effectively, um, which means not that Bitcoin wasn't here to stay. We all know that. But uh, I, I think this is a, a, a major turning point. And I, I think that that's yeah. uh, perhaps a takeaway that I've not really heard. Uh, stated elsewhere. I'm sure someone has. There's nothing new under the sun. But I think that that's a, I think a valuable insight. Yeah, I think definitely. that's amazing. It's going from the um, kind of like adolescent phase to its more mature phase in which we're getting that validation from the authorities, from the government, you know, whether they actually came out and endorsed it or not. It's a big step that, as you said, is putting it in motion. And there's really no turning back. You know, it's like we've crossed that line now 
um, to where we're moving forward with this and getting that validation in the public eye. And so um, we decided that you were great for this question, being a forward thinker and somebody who's kind of like having a vision of the future. I wanted to go back to a, a podcast I did with Tim Draper, and uh, he was kind of like explaining his vision for the future of Bitcoin. And, and he was kind of saying that back in the Clinton era, when Clinton was president and the Internet was coming about, um, the media were all over him and they were saying, are you going to tax this? Are you going to regulate it? How are you going to get in front of this thing? And instead of trying to control it, he essentially just let it rip. And as a result of that, we've got Google, Amazon, Apple, all in the US, Uber, all these incredibly innovative companies here. How do you see this playing out in the future for crypto? Do you think we could have a similar scenario if we were to head that route? Yeah, I think uh, to get to call it politics in the United States, I think this is a big victory for America. Uh, I mean, I can tell you as an American who ran for president and is involved in our situation, whether it be in my role in the United Nations, the work that I do with uh, Unicorn.org, the United Council of Rising Nations, where I teach innovation to heads of state, probably about 50 different governments around the world. Uh, this is a big one where a lot of American entrepreneurs, you know, have felt like leaving the U.S. A lot of businesses have felt like leaving the U.S., um, and capital markets were less inclined to invest in U.S. businesses because of the regulatory uncertainty. Capital markets like clarity. They like certainty. They, you know, and so this is, uh, I think, a great thing uh, 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 for American entrepreneurs and businesses and people that want to continue to live here um, that are Bitcoiners. And one of the other things I like to point out is that, you know, uh, Bitcoiners and crypto, call it currency people in general, we're single issue voters. Right. Maybe not the people that are buying ETFs, I'd say maybe they're, you know, you know, call it crypto curious. Um, but by the way, I also think that that's, a, you know, I think that's going to be a really useful thing, too. You know, one of the problems, you know, that so many newcomers uh, that come to Bitcoin have had uh, not as much these days because your centralized exchanges, you know, mitigate some of these risks, but it's loss of your first purchase. Right. It's loss of your first investment. How many people have lost their first? So many. <laughs> their first buy. Um, I, I, I mean, I can, certainly for those of us that relied on paper wallets back in the day, for anybody who knows what that is. Um, Absolutely. You know, this is, it's a legitimate yeah. issue. And if we want, you know, Moby to go mainstream, if we want this to become something that is truly accessible to the masses, you know, that security and that, you know, ease of call it entry, you know, as you, as you learn, you know, how this stuff works, I, I think that this is another, you know, positive step forward for the, the, those that don't know anything to be able to safely access the market to then do their research and then, you know, crawl before you walk, walk before you run. And uh, for those of us that have been, you know, in this market for a while, uh, the market's looking bullish, you know, just because yeah. we're down 15 percent right now, not take away the, from the fact that we are in bullish market conditions and we might be, you know, on the verge of, you know, our next bull run. And for those of us that know how to run uh, in a bull market, you know, you know, uh, this this could be a phenomenal year for all of us. Everybody should still feel, I think, very excited about uh, the prospects of 2024. And by the way, back to politics. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, both Donald Trump. Uh, uh, I think to Vivek's credit, but also RFK Jr., you know, have all have both spoken out and said not under their presidencies would they allow a central bank digital currency. Since we right. brought up politics, I think that is uh, relevant it's current uh, it's very uh, news. Big. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think these are these are all positive developments for the crypto community. So you're you're a visionary in the space. I think it's fair to say, Brock. Uh, you, you've got a, a track record behind you that that's uh, really enormous. So when you look at how long you've been invested in this and all that you've done, uh, you know what is your fondest hope for Bitcoin and for the greater crypto world in 2024? Well, I mean, it's back to we're in that sort of. Um, I'd say positive sentiment, bullish market conditions. And the good news is when things get, you know, bullish and go bull, you know, this is when, you know, capital starts getting allocated. This is when, you know, the conferences are at their largest. This is when the, what I call the, the conference circus, I mean, circuit uh, uh, <laughs> kicks off again. Like uh, well, this is when everybody at every dining room table, unfortunately, you start hearing all about it from your Uber drivers and taxi drivers and everywhere else. <laughs> You know, these are those market conditions where, uh, as I like to say, bear markets bear fruit, bull markets produce bull shit. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and, I like that. But it's, it, it, there's also a lot of good things that come out of it. You know, capital gets loose. Everything gets fun. And just keep your, you know, try to keep cool headed. Uh, if you've been through this market before, um, you know, be wise. <laughs> uh, uh, learn from your lessons. But it's exciting times. You know, this is when all your next batches of companies get funded. You know, some of them die in the next bear market. Some of them understand that, you know, you run in the bull market and you crawl in the bear market. You know, it's basically you go from, you know, you're, you're basically going into hibernation and hopefully you, you, you've you prepared yourself for each one of these market cycles. If we even end up with another one of those market cycles, right? It's a non-correlated asset class. You know, we tend to go up and down with, with other markets. You know, at some point, crypto does break free, uh, at least mm -hmm. theoretically. I've been talking about it for 10 years. So, I mean, it might be another 10 years before we reach that point. Um, but so much of this is dependent upon uh, uh, global market conditions. I mean, look at what's going on in, in Argentina. Uh, I can tell you talking to world leaders, uh, the desire to uh, embrace Bitcoin at a, at a national level and say, hey, this is a great thing. We want our people to have access to this. Um, you know, we're in, a, we're in a wonderful place. I'm, I, I couldn't be happier about the, uh, the outlook for 2024. Um, but like all things, you know, uh, you know, be careful. <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Brock. It, it's been an honor to speak to you again. Uh, we look forward to touching base with you more as, as more things develop over 2024. It looks like a really auspicious start to the year. And we very much appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Yes, thank, thank you. you. It's been amazing. And, uh, <laughs> until the next time. All right. Thanks, Brock. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Excellent. So now we're going to bring on a great panel. Uh, for those of you who follow the Benzinga spaces, the other spaces shows that I do, um, you know, you might know some, you might recognize some of these names. We've got Jesper Toft, Joey Garcia, uh, Stefan Rust. I think that, oh, and of course, Alex, uh, which is, which is great. So really some of my uh, favorite people, some of my favorite guests that I've had uh, giving us points of view that include, uh, you know, working with the UN, uh, being a lobbyist on, on Capitol Hill, lots of familiarity with, with Mika and with the SEC. So we're going to dig into that a little bit more about what the SEC sentiment is. So stick with us, everyone. Let's go ahead and bring the panelists up and get started into this. We've got a lot of territory to cover. Everyone, welcome. Hello. Hey. Hello. How are you? Um, it's so fantastic to have you all here. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I think we can all agree that this is, uh, you know, a good moment in time for uh, for crypto overall and for Bitcoin in particular, but hopefully for the investors. Um, let's go ahead and uh, and talk to. We'll, we'll start with Stefan since you're up top left. Stefan, why don't you uh, go ahead and just quickly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. You're hey, hi everybody. Stefan, Stefan Roost, uh, founder of Trueflation. Uh, Trueflation, we're a basically a definitive reference point for RWA pricing. Uh, one of the core indexes that we've built out um, is the inflation index, which we believe is the true inflation, aggregating some 18 million items, three price feeds per item every single day, and bringing that to the eight different blockchains uh, live today. Um, yeah, right. And you're you also uh, you're also the former uh, head of uh, Bitcoin.com, I, I believe. Right. So it's a, another great reason to have you on the panel. You're always a fantastic guest. So very glad to have you here. Um, Joey uh, from Zappo Bank. Why don't you you come on and tell us a little bit about uh, Zappo, a little bit what, about what you do? Sure. Good stuff. Uh, great to be here and lovely to meet all you guys. So Zappo Bank is really the first sort of bank credit institution that gives we're a Bitcoin native and blockchain native bank. So um, in the olden days, most of you guys will know when sis, a lot. Um, we moved a lots and lots of things in developing, let's call it a network or platform that allows access to everyday users to the to the asset and the community through established banking rail so it's the first sort of let's call it bridge between the bitcoin ecosystem and the banking universe um so that's why you know i've heard you guys talking about the etfs that's a natural progression right accessibility to this market we've been the first step in that space and, and excited to see how it's all developing 
Okay, perfect. And I can attest yeah. to how good that app is, by the way. I'm a customer of Zappo Bank app. It's a, it's a really hair, good. Stuff. Bank. It's a hair stuff. It's very well, cool. Cool. Expect. We, we have a real time testimony uh, for, <laughs> for you, Zappo. We, we can use that now. Uh, that, that's, that's great. Um, Jesper, always great to speak with you. Uh, you know, you very, Jesper very much has the EU side and sort of the global perspective on both traditional and uh, uh, digital uh, investments. Why don't you uh, come on and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, briefly what a GSU protocol does. Thank you, Justin. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm the founder of, of the GSU system. And uh, basically, we came out of the old monetary world where we developed a, a method to measure weighted volatility between all currencies. And we are able to quant quantify that point. So you have, you can call it a monetary GPS system, which is able to find the balance point in between all currencies in real time. That we are able to turn into an exchange rate. And then basically now we are creating the first coin that tracks that rate. Um, it's documented to be the world's most stable rate to all currencies. Mm -hmm. So you can, to some extent, compare it with you know, the first thing may be coming out of the um, of the blockchain that can disrupt the old world and not just importing, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what we see with a lot of dollar stable coins on the market. And yes, right. we, we have still contact with a number of central banks. So and and yes, I'm I have a deep un understanding of the Mikai if you want to speak about that. But uh, thank you for being here. I, I look forward yeah. to it. We'll definitely touch on it. And yeah, it's interesting just the idea of a stable coin not based on USD. Uh, you know, I'm, I've seen a couple of them at this point, but that is uh, sort of a new territory. Um, but let's go ahead over to Alex as well. Alex is from the, is a COO from Chamber of Digital Commerce and uh, spends a lot of time uh, on Capitol Hill talking to lawmakers. So I, I, we always appreciate your firsthand perspective. Why don't you come on and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks for uh, having me. I always joke that we're like Jon Snow on the wall and the winter is coming and, you know, we're one of the few ones actually guarding it. Uh, uh, we lobby for the space, represent the space. We're the largest uh, trade organization in the space, the oldest. We've been around for nine years and we represent a lot of the more mature players, the fidelities of the world, uh, some of the major banks. Uh, you can go to our website and see who we have and, and some of the major tech players. Um, and some of them are actually uh, will remain confidential, but uh, we we're, we're pushing forward and hoping to have pro innovation, uh, pro crypto sensible regulation adopted in the U.S. so that we can all enjoy this technology and, and help spread freedom and uh, and you know innovation around the world. Perfect. That's that's great. You know, has there been? A, I mean, it's a great organization, a Chamber of Digital Commerce. By the way, everyone, um, you know, worked with Benzinga on our. Uh, on our last show th this past December, the future the future of digital assets. Have you, have you been inundated with a whole new uh, swath of, of, of inquiries uh, since this has gone through? You're getting more. I mean, you're already working with a, a bunch of TradFi uh, uh, companies. Uh, has there been more of that since the approval? Is, is it feeling more like a green light to everyone? Well, I think the approval is the market is recovering. And so that's been more of the mover. I think the approval hasn't fully kicked in yet. Uh, you know, as their investment advisors go out to the clients and pitch the ETFs, we'll probably see that, I'm guessing, in the next, you know, four to six to eight months really start picking up. Um, so we're seeing we're seeing interest. It's probably more correlated with the market recovery than it is with the approval. But there's no shortage of work. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'll dive into this. Uh, there are many folks on Capitol Hill that are still very anti uh, the industry. And so sure. our work just doesn't stop. All right. Perfect. All right. Yeah. And like to kick this off, I think we just get right into it on the ETF approval and why, first off, why we believe, I mean, the SEC is evidently losing ground to deny the ETF approval. So why now? Did they approve it? Why did they choose right now at this moment in January to approve it? And then we'll do a follow-up question about um, why now did BlackRock choose to apply for it? So um, I'd like to hear your guys' uh, thoughts on that matter. And then I'll give you another uh, example of some of the theories about why BlackRock has suddenly changed their mind about getting into this industry. But love to hear what you guys think on this topic. Let's go ahead over to uh, uh, Stefan. We'll start with you. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, why they exactly proved it? I mean, I think the pressure just has grown. The demand is there. Um, and and yeah, so I think just they had to cave to the pressure. Uh, they were losing legal battles left, right and center. Um, a lot of people were demanding change. I think the pressure just grew. And as a result, now that institutions like BlackRock, Fidelity, uh, Fanec are all of a sudden engaging and, and, and providing additional credibility, um, you know, they just felt that I think that pressure just got too big. And, you know, here we are today, ETF approved. And, you know, it's a start. I think everybody was expecting a lot of money to pour in right away. And mm -hmm. I think nobody realized that actually GBTC sitting on a lot of ETF, uh, sorry, um, you know, trust owner holders, and they're going to migrate across because the cost structure of an ETF is a lot cheaper. Everybody didn't realize how much actually FTX is sitting on in terms of their shares. And so that's a billion dollars worth of GBTCs. Those are just being sold. Those aren't being replenished and, and converted. Um, but it's users and holders of the GBTC that are actually selling it in the market. And some of them will be taking profit because they bought it at the 30, 50 percent discount, you know, early around 2023. And so, you know, that was a big trade that a lot of investors did buying volume and bulk of GBTC at discount and then selling it when it hit parity with the, the Bitcoin price. And so I think those are just elements that have kicked in. And, you know, the, the way institutions start buying and purchasing these ETFs is going to be, you know, it's a golf game here. It's a convincing you how to do this there, um, sitting down for big meetings, big presentations. I got committees to, co to convince and then boom, I might allocate 0.5% of our endowment will go towards this ETF. And so that's going to sort of take some time to work through the sales channels as they do in more traditional finance sales processes. Yeah. Uh, I Alex, think, Justin, if, if yeah, I can just I'm, jump in as well, like yeah. it, it's also relevant, right, to hear and always see sort of where the U.S. is positioning itself in, in these sort of markets yeah. around the world. So, you know, allowing everyone talks about some of the issues around the SEC, et cetera, but allowing secure access to Bitcoin as an asset class through a structured and regulated ETF seems like quite rather than allowing or forcing continued unregulated access global points to this market, creating sort of these secure entry points. Plus, where is the US sitting versus the rest of the world? I mean, it's, you know, BlackRock and Barclays and JPM, they, they're, I mean, they're using blockchain technology and all sorts of milestone collateral transactions now. I mean, Europe, Europe um, Euroclear, the, the big sort of European clearinghouse, they're already issuing tokenized digital euro bonds. Um, I think Namur in Japan have already launched the Ethereum spot um, fund. HSBC are talking, well, they've already uh, issued the tokenized ownership of physical gold. Thailand, you know, there are, there are banks there buying stakes in crypto exchange platforms. There was a big purchase the other day, Standard Chartered and Zodia, they've you know, deployed themselves in, in Hong Kong. So there are a lot of things happening in the world. And the U.S. being such a leader in this regard, I think it's quite important for for them to sort of put the foot in the door and say we're here and we want to, you know, structure these arrangements. So yeah, I, I see mm -hmm. that as one hopefully relevant step. Let's see. As a as a follow up to that question, though, what I would like to know what you guys think is so Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, you know, he was interviewed about three years ago and said absolutely no one was interested in this asset and they're not talking about it, they're not requesting it. And then he he openly says, yes, I've changed my mind. Uh, notoriously, yeah. the BlackRock has filed for hundreds of ETFs, been rejected yeah. for like one out of 540. So why now? Is it simply the right time mm -hmm. in the market? Do they have the, is it because they have the rails in place now to, to accept customers' money? Or a theory by Arthur Hayes, for example, the ex-CEO of BitMet, uh, BitMEX, um, he says that it could be a hedge against the trad traditional finance system in some way, as Kathy Wood calls it a flight to safety, and Larry Fink calls it a flight to quality. And then exactly. we had the bank run in which Bitcoin went from 19000 to $30,000. So could it be that if there were to be troubles in the traditional financial world that BlackRock wants and other entities want to want the money to maintain within the traditional financial structure? Mm. Um, what do you guys think about this and the timing of this? Yeah. Go, Alex. Let's go ahead. Uh, let's go ahead to Alex, then we'll go over to Jesper. Go ahead, Alex. I can jump in. I just want to uh, mention something that Joey said before. It's very critical. You know, as Churchill says or said, 
the U.S. always does the right thing after exhausting all other options. And so here we are. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm 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 bullish on the U.S. because we do end up doing the right thing after exhausting all other options. And man, have we exhausted all those other options uh, before approving the the spot ETF? Look, they, they just a touch on the other point. They approved it because they got they got it was a extremely uh, it was a it was a big loss for them in the D.C. Circuit Court. All three judges basically said they were capricious in their decision and arbitrary and capricious. And that's in legal terms. It's a it's a pretty big insult to the SEC uh, as, as lawyers get. Why did BlackRock go in? I don't know if, you know, maybe Arthur Hayes is right. He's been fairly prescient of, uh, on many things in the space. I think people who study Bitcoin ultimately understand Bitcoin. Look, the rails they've always had. The ETF rails have been around for a while. And actually, an ETF is a fantastic consumer wrapper to get people into this product because mom and pop, you know, my, my mom and dad, and I'm sure all of our friends that are normies are not going to go in and self-custody coins. It's just hard. It's hard. And, and so ETF solves the custody problem now for institutions. They're targeting, you know, small family offices down to retail investors. That's what the ETF is for. Mm -hmm. Outside of the ETF, I think they're starting to see the demand in the market because I would encourage us to look beyond the spot ETF and think about all the other financial products that will be layered onto it. Options. Uh, mm -hmm. Grayscale already uh, filed for an options ETF, right? So, so you'll have covered calls. You'll have various exotics built upon the spot ETF using that as as the base, if you will. And this is this is what happens in all traditional markets as they become more monetized and then they become more mature. I think BlackRock sees the demand. I'm sure they understand. I'm sure once you study Bitcoin, Larry Fink came around to it. I'm, I'm hoping he's actually doing it not just for the business opportunity because he understands what Bitcoin brings to people around the world. And ultimately, I think it's hard to deny a better technology. And Bitcoin is just a better technology. And it's institutional. It's at a scale that other crypto projects aren't. And so for Tradify to get in and a serious way to markets, you need to have an asset that's you know, why do we look at volumes in the ETF space versus AUM assets under management? You need to have a deep market that you can trade in and out of and move in and out of without, you know, moving the market down. There's no slippage or very little slippage. Bitcoin is the only one, potentially Ethereum. I'm sure we'll talk about that ETF. But I think it was just it, the time comes and everyone buys Bitcoin at the price they deserve. And here, you know, here we are. This is when the normies are going to get in. BlackRock will get in. But over the long term, it's it's going to be, uh, you know, this, they'll be like that BC and AD, you know, before the ETF and after the ETF. I think it's a very pivotal moment in our space. And, and you know, just to play off that a little bit, it, Jesper, part part of the, the reason why I thought you'd be great for the panel, I wanted to get a perspective, you know, coming out of the EU as well. Uh, it did not be so completely uh, U.S. centric as media in the U.S. often is, in my opinion. You know, um, I'm just going to point out for the people at home who don't know, of course, Bitcoin ETFs have been available for several years uh, in in the EU. Um, you know why all the adulation, and is it shared? You know, on on, on a global level, is that because it's unlocking a huge new market? Of course, I mean, I suppose that's true. Or is this what kind of validation is this to have it approved? Uh, have Bitcoin ETFs approved in the U.S.? I think it is is a monster thing. It, it's really big, and uh, the way I see it, it's not like you can expect the price to rise, you know, fast, uh, just like uh, it was said before. It's more like uh, it's a stamp that this is relevant. So it's it's went from not relevant to being relevant because now, uh, due to the court, and that's I think the timing uh, is only due to the pressure from the court uh, to actually do this. So if the court hadn't stepped in last year, uh, then it wouldn't have happened. So, um, and, and I, I actually read Gansler's statement uh, in connection with, with this approval of the ETF, and it's definitely not very positive. <laughs> it's definitely, you know, I'm highly against this, and I don't endorse it, I don't like it. And, um, uh, but, but nevertheless, he had to. And it's like saying, all right, I cannot uh, disregard this anymore. This is mm -hmm. relevant for everybody, for the end user, for the companies, for the investors, uh, for the financial system. So, and now, as, as Stefan just said before, now we will have a long process of selling it in. 
because it's not going to be a fast sale, but it's going to be a humongous big sale. <laughs> and um, and that, that's how I see it. And uh, if you look at the media in the crypto industry, um, most media coverage about uh, crypto in Europe is very negative. It's just like, mm -hmm. I don't know why, but it's, it just is. And, um, and if you look at the crypto media, they're mostly driven by US interests. And so, of course, it's mostly about what's going on in the U.S. arena. Um, and therefore, the focus has been very much on, on the U.S. ETF. And I think it's like I'm just super happy because it's going to um, it, it's taking the small shark from the lake into the big sea with the big sharks. But that also, you know, uh, potentially poses a bit of a threat, because if you saw what Jamie Dimon said at the World Economic Forum uh, just last week, you know, he's still really much against uh, mm -hmm. Bitcoin. And, and now he has an easy access to short it. Uh, so, so when you go into this game, you have to understand it's both a big opportunity because we can, you know, promote it uh, to the whole world now, but it's also to some extent a threat because the players who do not like us uh, will, you know, have the uh, tools they use uh, to try to push it the, the other way. Right, definitely. You know, you know uh, leading my next question, though, uh, obviously everyone on the panel and almost everyone listening, a bunch of huge Gary Gensler fans, as no doubt we are. How could you not be? That face, that charm. <laughs> Alex, <laughs> Alex is thinking like, yeah, you don't actually have to talk to him, Justin. I <laughs> I guess you'll be in the same room with him at some point or another. I'm just kidding, of course, Gary. Um, he has many. Merit, he is a very meritorious individual, after all. But I, I think it might be fair to say that um, the relationship between the crypto and the SEC last year was, uh, at times, slightly pugilistic. There, there have been uh, yeah, people have suggested that there was um, regulation being done by litigation throughout last year. Do you, are we seeing a turning point? I mean, we, we, we're, we're characterizing a thing here where the SEC made this decision because the precedent with the Grayscale case kind of put them in the position of having to, of having to admit the inevitability. Are we looking at a kinder, gentler relationship with our regulators here in the U.S. in 2024? Stefan, come on, what, what do you think? G give me some optimism, man. You, you, you've, you've got, you're an optimistic spirit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm very optimistic for crypto and, and all the work that I've been seeing taking place around improving the user experience around decentralized services. I am very pessimistic around the regulatory framework. I think there is still going to be an even greater battle taking place between the decentralized finance mm -hmm. and the centralized finance and the legacy infrastructure. Uh, the legacy players will not give up their power and their role in the ecosystem lightly. They're going to fight, die hard, tooth and nail, leverage every single lobby cent and micro cent that they can find, even though that's losing power in purchasing capability. Um, but they're going to do that. And, and I just don't see ETF is just more reason to shut down anything decentralized. Look at Europe. Europe's trying to put into a law where any transfer on a peer to peer basis greater than I think it's a thousand dollars has yeah. to have to go through a middleman. So all mm -hmm. of a sudden, what? The whole point is taking out costs in the system. You're layering in legally from a regulatory standpoint, toll takers who right. add zero value in the ecosystem. Oh, oh, I mean, and uh, they, I mean, it's just to me, it's just baffling, and I think we're going to see more and more of regulatory hurdles like that come about and all that's going to do is push away the innovation that is in front of us here that will create millions of new jobs trillions in new income and trillions in tax dollars as a result out of that and so mm -hmm. you're pushing that offshore already today 75 percent of crypto developers are no longer in the u.s 75% of developers, 12% of them are in India. And so what does that mean? That means we're moving a lot of them. Europeans have all shifted offshore. They're now living in Dubai. Why? Yeah. Because the tax-friendly, the friendly legal infrastructure, you can build in Abu Dhabi, you can now build structured products today 
in the financial. So all those products that we were referring to, I think Joey or or Alex, you mentioned them, right? So I can layer on top, I can use collateral, I can build other structured types of products, financial products off the back of these ETFs. They're being developed in Abu Dhabi, you know, or Hong Kong or Singapore or Zurich, Switzerland, right? So those are the markets that are trying to create hubs where you can then go and create these interesting products. And that is where the excitement lies. That is where new job opportunities are going to be created. Millions of dollars in salaries going to be earned as well as profits generated in those markets that will then provi provide tax income, which will then pay off the debt that those countries are suffering with right now, right? And so right. I think that's where the opportunity lies and the excitement. I mean, Zappo Bank is in Gibraltar for a reason, right? You know, um, mm -hmm. And so that's that's why you're seeing these markets play out and, and provide interesting new jurisdictions that mm. are where I can work. I used to be in Austin. I'm now in Zurich, right? Why? You know, it's like because I've, there's talent here. There's opportunities here. And there's a legal framework that's a bit more friendly. I mean, I'm not only here, but I'm rotating between the two. But that's that's beside the point. And, and you just see and feel the opportunity optimism that resides in in markets like zurich or abu dhabi and dubai i love the, that the, analysis that's yeah. amazing yeah yeah definitely Stefan's Steph, is always always great um you know i, I don't i don't know joey I, I i detect a certain apprehension in Stefan's tone however in regards to the sec of course sapo has to keep on top of this globally um, you know, what do you think? Or, or could we look at, at sunnier climbs with the SEC, maybe less, um, you know, suing Binance and, and telling CZ that he can't leave the country? Maybe fewer of those kind of the optics get a little odd around that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. when you're trying to balance it in with some sort of uh, opening up of things with crypto. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think. There are two angles to this. So, uh, and there's one point I was going to mention earlier, which is the, the question that Megan put about sort of why are the views of platforms like BlackRock changing now? Why do we have the BlackRock CEO come out saying, you know, crypto is going to play a, a relevant sort of flight to quality? I would say the whole ecosystem, there's a fundamental point about learning and understanding what this is. So, all of us that had conversations with authorities or policymakers or banks or whatever it was five, six, seven, eight years ago, as Zappa was doing, um, it was all this awful world that we were creating and it was all crazy. And you'd have meetings with regulatory authorities. They wouldn't send policy teams. They would send you know, enforcement units to talk to you about trying to regulate the space. So things are, and th that's what has always happened, right? So even in the banking universe, when the ATM came around as a concept, the world would like oppose it. Or when internet banking came around, it would be opposed. This is all crazy new technology and why you're all doing this. So there's a clear kind of learning process. And with the regulators, it's the same thing. And I would say, although there are lots of difficult things relating to the US, can't go into all of that stuff, I would say that there are many jurisdictions in the world, many jurisdictions in the world that are learning uh, about this ecosystem and they've not really decided on the kinds of frameworks that they want to introduce. So there's a quasi kind of let's see what the US does. Now the EU is defining a new a standard. That's going to be extremely interesting. You have countries like Korea, very looking very, very closely at, uh, at Mika. You have most of the world looking at now, it's not just FATF, right? It's IOSCO, it's the FSB, all these international organizations defining standards and countries have to react to that. But, you know, there are some, you know, some people will pitch Europe as a, a saving grace solution with the Mika framework. And it does, it is fantastic in one sense, but a lot of those authorities are also going to go through very, very deep learning curves. And I can tell you, some countries in Europe have like 18 or 20,000 CASP related entities registered in those countries. You know, that's going to create a whirlwind of, of issues as well. So I wouldn't quite put it as simply as the US is very, very bad. The rest of the world provides a solution. But I would absolutely, I would absolutely agree with Stefan from the point of view is a lot of those authorities are very open. They want, they have a whiteboard style approach. They want to talk to you. They want to understand. They want to interact with the ecosystem and they want to define appropriate uh, standards and frameworks for the industry. Some other countries, and I probably put the US in that category, are sort of, we have rules. We have the definition of a security. We have existing infrastructure. Let's just fit all of this new universe into that legacy framework and i really mm -hmm. don't think that's the right approach to take at all so that's you my know, view 
Jesper has has been alluded to uh, as has been alluded to a couple of times here. I, I want, I mean, at least the thing about the EU and, and Mika is at least you have Mika. Like we <laughs> <laughs> can grow into that. So, you know, it's like yeah, you know, admire someone else is when you're younger. You have to admire someone else's crappy car if you have no car at all. I, I yeah. actually, I That's actually, think, you know, to some extent, the US was behind, but with this move, because. Y- Yes, they 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 did uh, sue Binance, etc. Um, but they didn't put in place a final law that simply makes it difficult. Yeah, they did make some lawsuits, mm-hmm. uh, but with the ETF, as um, as Alex correctly said, you know, they 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 did the right thing and actually showing, all right, we are also going to be dominant in in this market here. Uh, they haven't they haven't decided on a final law that is difficult to work within. And I would say as an issuer, um, uh, the Mika is really, really difficult. It's it's, Mm. uh, like we can do whatever we want from the regulatory. It's like uh, from July this year, if you want to introduce a new current, uh, it needs to have a white paper that uh, actually meets the criteria of a prospectus. Uh, It needs to be approved. There is no process for that approval. So they can stretch it for half a year or a year, what, mm. as long as they like. Um, mm. And yeah. just yesterday, I read this part, which is about the new framework that is coming, is the AML framework that they're discussing, where, as Stefan correctly said, that self-custody addresses holding more than a thousand euro will be illegal. Mm-hmm. And I'm just thinking, how the fuck will they control that? You know, and yeah. um, the, the and, other, and, I'm, and, I'm interested, Jess. I'm interested, Jess, and see what you think because, like, defining the right regulatory standards, it's it's very important. But some people have said, I mean, I was part, Zappo were part of uh, Libra, obviously, and that the whole uh, significant asset class of a stable conditions in the EU. I mean, you're bringing an issuer not only within the scope of the national regulatory authority but also the ecb the european central bank that's really significant so the the question of you know it's it's proportionality is it is it proportionate to apply that level of regulation to an incumbent startup uh, industry and is there a form of i mean i always call it a tech infringement so you know we can operate ebay and i can sell you and stefan a baseball bat now i'm going to digitize that baseball bat uh, using a form of blockchain technology for you know, an immediate cross-border settlement and no risk and it all sounds wonderful. Now I've digitized it. Now I'm using a blockchain. Now I'm a fully blown regulated financial services business in Europe. That, you know, I, I, that I, is pretty I, tough. I think the problem is exactly as, as, as Justin said before, that they are trying to squeeze in. They understand the old world very well, but they really mm. do not understand the technology. And therefore they are looking into the old world. It's like trying to create the rule for driving using the environmental law uh, or, you know, using a l- other legal framework instead of, you know, saying, all right, what is this going to do um, for the way that people possess their assets? And um, mm. I, 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 I'm, I'm really not very fond of Mika, to be honest. I see that the problem I see in it really is that there are all these rubber uh, paragraphs that just leaves a lot of decision with the local uh, authorities. They, they're not obligated to reply. They can take as long as they want. There's no reason. They don't need to argue why they don't approve it, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, it, it becomes a matter of opinion rather than are you actually, you know, qualified to, to do what you, yeah. you want to yeah, do. But, but this all flows through from the FSB. So um, the FSB issue, the very most famous statement is, you know, same activity, same risk, same rules. So there are lots of countries in the world that literally read that and take it literally as the same rules applying to like this completely new uh, universe. And I, I wouldn't be opposed to similar risks uh, and, and similar activity so let's create standards that are similar in terms of you know what the what the objectives of the rules are but not using exactly the same rules and that's really you can't dangerous. use the same rules yeah. you can't the use system was 70 years 70 years old 
right? Yeah. Implemented for a completely different time in society and in completely different technology. So it's, yeah, it's and, and, and Yeah, as, as Stefan would talked about the whole DeFi universe. And again, that's even more sensitive because if you try to apply the same activity, same rules principle to a decentralized network, or, or, or probably it's just even more bizarre. So, you know, there, there, mm -hmm. there are lots of countries literally trying to figure out what to do, how to approach this, how to form standards and thinking of it as a whiteboard style open approach. But on the, on the, DeFi, on the DeFi angle to that, in the UAE, you already have a free zones, uh, you know, uh, focused on that. So you can actually operate a DeFi in, in, in Rakhdao, uh, you know, specialized in that area. And for that reason alone, I think a lot of like the EU will lose out um, mm -hmm. in, in that area because they are saying, all right, we understand it. They hired some very, very qualified people. They created a framework and a, a stable platform from where you can operate. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, business will just go there. I'd like to get uh, Alex's, uh, you know, take on this, Alex, because what I'm trying to say about the SEC's attitude and are we looking at a kind of a sunnier day is like, you know, in terms of optics, which is how I tend to think about things, uh, you know, they were just kind of put into a corner where perhaps it's arguable they kind of had to approve. They, they had, you know, uh, resisted as long as they could. You know, what's the move from here? Because it seems like it could go one of two ways. They could either assert their dominance again by taking the next Binance, uh, whoever else, I won't speculate on who, and uh, and you know, bring them in, into uh, uh, litigation. Uh, or they could, or is this an opportunity for them to maybe establish a better rapport? And and will this be addressed or, or, or will they be quiet and uh, leading up to the uh, actual presidential election? You know, what way does it seem like the winds are blowing in Capitol Hill right now? Unfortunately, the winds are blowing one of one ways. Okay, the SEC is not changing <laughs> anything anytime soon, uh, not under the current administration. And so uh, there are many things that are going on in Capitol Hill outside of the SEC, the whole security versus commodity you know, a, the, the discussion. There sure. are accounting rules that we're, for example, pushing on uh, proof of reserves. There is like uh, uh, using mixers and FinCEN and etc. However, those are all important things. They're skirmishes. The war, so to speak, is we need to have policy. Uh, we, this has to be an act of Congress. We cannot continue to adjudicate this to the courts. And Elections have consequences in the U.S., in Europe, and so on. This is a very big year for crypto. We're tilting in a major way towards the elections and getting the right candidates in. We've been asking for donations here and so on and so forth, not to plug it, but to plug it because as a space, we're pretty bad about actually mm -hmm. you know, organizing and, and being able to go after and put the right candidates uh, into office and punish the ones that, frankly, don't like crypto. Uh, well, and the chamber's a nonprofit as well. I'm I'm okay uh, plugging nonprofits. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Look, I mean, we win when everyone wins, right? Truly, right. I, there's we're, every dollar goes towards some some sort of defense of the industry. Um, Gary, there's I don't know if he stays in this position after this election, regardless of who wins. Um, obviously, if we elect a more pro crypto candidate. At the presidential level, even RFK is is speaking about mm -hmm. it. There is Dean Phillips that's being that's starting to rise up. Um, I actually don't know his stance on crypto. He's he's a very young uh, candidate, but he's starting to rise up against Biden. I don't know if under a Biden administration we get any kind of relief. Although I do think Gary Gensler moves on. He has political ambitions. Always has. This is why his stance is what it is. But elections have consequences, and so. You know, we we have to show up big in this election. We just have mm -hmm. to. I'm not going to tell anyone who to vote for other than I hope we elect more pro-crypto, open-minded candidates into office because otherwise, I, I, I think uh, it was uh, Joey or Stefan said this, that, you know, they, uh, Stefan mentioned developers going overseas. It's it's 100 percent true. We're, we're mm -hmm. bleeding out developers and we're frankly seeding, you know, from a patriotic perspective, uh, we're seeding the financial leadership that the U.S. has. And I'll just one really quick point. New York, by the way, gets this. 
And there are a lot of politicians in New York, especially Manhattan-oriented politicians, uh, governors, uh, 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 the mayor, uh, Richie Torres coming out of New York uh, from the House of Representatives, understand that we're ceding financial leadership of the future to the rest of the world. And right. that it's just, it's it's unfortunate. Yeah. And there, yeah. And there, and is, that, there is that. Megan, so, so there is, there is, the, the big, or biggest sensitivity is, is speed and pace. It's an incredibly fast moving industry. The evolution is just a lightning speed. What the FATF were talking about in 2019, I mean, half of that isn't even relevant or only in 20, just beginning of 2024. So for me as an external person, when I, and I spend a lot of time with colleagues in the US, very, very, very smart people. And I find it absolutely incredible. Sort of seven years we're having the same discussion the eu is not a fast moving body but they've done a hell of a lot and and we're still here sort of talking about the security tests and it's just spectacular from an external point of view we're sort of all 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 that's being asked is to give some form of legal and regulatory clarity and certainty to the mm -hmm. industry and platforms like zappo who had the bit license in new york and were operating over there we moved what to a small jurisdiction where we could literally in Gibraltar, engage with the government, engage with the policymakers, legislate from the ground up, build a framework that we were comfortable with and that provided all of our users and consumer security, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you know, it wasn't to avoid the US. It was because we couldn't get that clarity there. That's the right. reality. But, but I do think Europe is very different to the US. Europe yeah. is, they love regulating, right? I mean, they're a yeah. bunch of regulators, a bunch of bureaucrats, and they pride themselves on regulation. There are no tech lead. There is no tech leadership in Europe, right? It's all in the US. Um, the US is really much more a balance of power, right? You have the lobbyists that really dictate the influence of regulators and governments, right? So in a way, it's much more commercially driven. And the powers that be have a lot more funding and have allocated a lot more resources towards driving their message and protecting their positions in an economy. Um, and so I think they're very separate economy. And I think the regulators have no clue in Europe what is good for business. They just are proud. Oh, we did this great document. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clap. Look at them. I mean, a whole bunch of regulators clap themselves in a room. They're standing there. Oh, we, we, we did an AI law. We're the best, right? And the worst thing that happened to Europe was this, I don't know, the privacy law that they put into place that now means every time you come to Europe, you get a nice pop-up, accept cookies, accept cookies, accept, and nobody reads them anymore. And I don't know what the purpose of that is. It, all it is is create a worse user experience. And this idea of having to find middlemen is creating worse user experiences. I think it's all about the incentives. And what the US did phenomenally well was incentivizing the internet business when they gave sales tax for free if you bought using online services. Sure. That's learned a whole new industry. And look at all the jobs that are created. Look at the leadership that came out of those companies. And, uh, you know, and, and just uh, from an economic standpoint, that leadership that was created. Vivek, I thought, put out a really good framework that would help drive adoption for, a, you know, it was like terminating, you know, the workforce at the SEC. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, of course, gets buzzed. Yeah. But I mean, ultimately, he said, you know, do not directing the government not to target crypto software developers, permit self-hosted wallet use without tax reporting requirements. You don't need it. As soon as I have your wallet address anyway, I see all your income. I see all your movements. Come on, you know, spend those sleuths, those 80,000 new tax guys just to watch and learn how to track explorers. That's all they need to do and then regulate crypto as a commodity. And I thought that was a great framework to start with. Simple, you know, it's like 10 commandments, that's all we need, those are the guidelines. And if you're outside of those, we'll slap you and we'll come after you and we'll figure out how far outside of those you can go. But it's a great start to drive innovation, drive job creation and drive income and, and, and wealth generation for a new generation because all of us are here building out new systems not just new 
currency. We're building new systems that are going to replace and make the old systems redundant. As we saw what Amazon did to Barnes and Noble, what Netflix did to Blockbuster, right? Those are all innovations that came about because we were allowing that disruption. Ooh, ooh, ooh. But when it comes to money, when it comes to data, when it comes to AI, ooh, that we won't allow. Oh, when it comes to gene technology, health and wellness, ooh, those we won't allow, right? Because I don't know why, because we as a boomer generation, we don't like that. Or I don't know what the terms and the reason behind that is, but that is the view. And I think frameworks like Vivek that he put out, maybe it's not perfect. Maybe there's room for improvement, but that is the framework that we need that will bring back and bring about what we saw in the internet boom come to the, you know, sort of crypto boom and maybe other industries. That's well, amazing. That's the point I was going to bring yeah. up earlier, Stefan, is this is something that we went over with uh, earlier speaker Brock Pierce. Um, you know, during the time of the Internet and the Clinton administration and the media was asking him, are you going to get out in front of this? Or are you going to regulate this? And he kind of just let it rip. He let it be free. And, and as a result of that, we have Amazon in the U.S. We've got Uber. We've got all the biggest players, Google. And what like since 2021, since Gary Gensler was voted into office and now up to 2023, we have like double the crypto enforcement actions since he became in office. And it's just, you know, like Tim Draper said on my podcast, it's the fact that or he believes that the the stronger leaders allow for that freedom, allow for that innovation and let people yeah. be, be free, which leads to better yeah. GDP, which creates those jobs, doesn't stifle innovation. So when looking at it like that, and if somebody gets elected that's pro crypto, do you think we could take that route again? Have we fumbled that leadership? Because one of the things he said is he didn't anticipate how hard traditional, you know, people in the government and regulators would fight to protect the power of the dollar and the traditional financial system without being open to new systems. So how do you see that changing if we get different leadership? Do you think we could go that route or does it need to be different now that there's kind of like different risks at, in place? I think we need different leadership that's also going to bring about different types of ways to manage the administration associated with the leadership and to back the leadership versus constantly building out a bureaucracy and protecting the bureaucracies underlying, you know, the protecting my bureaucracy, my role, because all we've seen budgets in governments just grow. They never shrink. They never shift. They never cut something down and focus on a new system. I look at the federal systems statistical system. I mean, that's that's now 20 departments with overlapping reaches. None of them talk to each other. They've all got you know bloated organizations, manually aggregating data, not using new systems, don't have the budget to afford new systems, but we have the budget to hire 80,000 new headcount. And if you look at the job creation over the last three to four years, it's been in government. It hasn't been in the private sector. The private sector has been very selective in hiring resources that help them further um, their cause, right? And so how do we get rid of the management layer inside, as, as Vivek puts it, inside these governments? And I think if you have a new leader coming in and based on some of the candidates out there, you know, we're still hopeful that they will maybe identify opportunities where we can reduce some of these bureaus, change the incentives in terms of how they're operated so that they can then do the best for the nation versus actually hindering ed ed evolution and hindering innovation and slowing down economy, right? Absolutely. Well, at least I'm hopeful, but you never know. I mean, you know, it's like, it, it, what's not, a, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's definitely not going to be an easy task, but Elon Musk managed to pull it off at at, at Twitter, he got rid of 90% of the people, and then ultimately, with 10% of the staff, I'm producing more in the la in, in, in over the period of four, five, six months than they produced since inception. I mean, okay, take that with a grain of salt, take that with a bit of marketing, you know, and you know, but still, that is now sort of the mantra. If you look at Silicon Valley and tech companies, are going to start doing that too. That's like the effective accelerationism movement, which is very counter to the bureaucratic movement of effective regulation or overregulation or rulemaking upon rulemaking. You know, it, it, it's just an interesting little point to think about. We touched upon earlier how you can look at the wallet address. You can see everything that's moving in and out. We've taken an I don't know if your listeners or the viewers have been paying attention to the ETF flows. And you have uh, Eric Balkunas. Uh, and Jeff Safer, they're pretty good on, on crypto on X, on crypto X, I guess. 
um, and crypto Twitter that talk about the flows and they do these daily tallies and there's whole mess about T plus one, T plus two settlement, what the settlement is. And I remember asking the same question of Matt Hogan from, uh, from Bitwise, they're a member of ours and we did our uh, spaces and it was talking about all the settlement. But the irony is that we're taking a transparent asset and stuffing it into an opaque system Exactly. Where we're trying to figure out these these flows and open knows until the data is reported and a couple of days later and the money is sent to these APs. And it, it's just, you know, the, it's it's the height of irony of what's what's actually happening. Sooner or later, these guys will all come around. I think a lot of it will sit on blockchain rails, if you will. And I think a lot of it will actually sit on Bitcoin rails just because it's the most immutable chain and you want to stay, store your your value in the most immutable chain. Um, but it's just, you know, it's, it's like, it's slowly, but, but painfully we're getting there, but it's very painful. The whole thing. Is very painful. You know, I, I'm going to float out a question. We have about five minutes left, by the way. Thanks to all the guests for staying a few minutes later. Uh, Megan and I don't need 15 minutes of outro. So I figure we'll add it to the panel. Although we could, I could get me my ukulele. We could sing some songs. Maybe it'll be fun. We'll try that for next time though. But, um, you know, just to throw another question out there, I, I already know that a couple of people on the panel have opinions about this, but is it too conspiratorial to look at the time the SEC took in approving the Bitcoin ETF and think to yourself that there's a certain amount of protectionism uh, around the dominance of USD on a global stage? I mean, granted, BTC is not going to replace it next year or in the next well, 10 years? I don't know. I mean, it's it's possible. It's looking more possible than it looked in 2017, that's for sure. Um, you know, do you think that that uh, motivated some of, some of the delays? Jesper, what do you think? I think they don't know what to do because if you're good at playing chess, which they definitely are in Washington, they know the end game. And that is that the USD will lose its position to some extent. Uh, to, to alternatives. And, and basically the function of, of, um, of the dollar is uh, for the central banks as a reserve currency. Uh, so other countries are holding some USD. Um, and then the other part is for transactions and there are for private holders. These are like the three main groups. And uh, I think it's quite obvious that it will have to you, you, you control 88% of all global transactions goes through the US dollar on a daily basis. That's 7 trillion on a daily basis going through the USD where the USD only makes up really, or the US only makes up less than 10% of global trade. Mm -hmm. So there's like a, a, a 78% that could go between South Africa and Australia and Japan and China uh not using the usd and that's why there is this humongous resistance uh, because what is this going to mean uh what influence is it going to have and just like we are having this conference now online uh, and we can see pictures and we speak you know we couldn't do that 30 years back um and and it's the same evolution we are going to see with the blockchain that better things, better stability is going to come out of the blockchain than exist in the old world, that it by far will outperform the US dollar. And, um, and, and of course, they don't like it. You know, mm, if I was right. the US dollar, I wouldn't like it either. But that's, that's, I, that's how it is. I, I think like the the I'm I'm I don't think that the US is that concerned about US currency dominance or at least it's not even in the same bracket as many 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 other countries in the world. No. Uh, I mean, if you you know start talking about the Argentinian peso or Zimbabwe, okay. think about Venezuela, think about many jurisdictions across Africa, etc. There's real real currency concern. I mean, if you talk to some of those jurisdictions about uh, you know currency or, or, or Bitcoin price volatility, they look at you like, what are you, 
what are you talking about? That's not volatile. Volatile is my savings in my bank account. Mm. Uh, 150% inflation, massive volatility, and suddenly you have this access point to a unit of value that is not controlled locally. So that that the ETF has a piece to play in that, but the Bitcoin community has a, all the access to the protocol has mm. different points to play, and that will be a different point of attraction. That is definitely escalating. That's got nothing to do with uh, the US. Can, so. I, can I just jump on to this point? I, I think we need to think of this as uh, Nick Batia wrote a great book, Layered Money, for those who haven't read it. It's a great fast read. We just have to think of our system as layered money. I, I believe that Bitcoin will eat part of the dollar, but it won't eat the dollar fully. And incidentally, the way to keep a reserve currency, is the reserve currency, you have to be open and cannot have any capital controls. Because once you have capital controls, it allows another currency or another money to step in and say well we're more free so use us why would you something less free than more free all things being equal and so i think you know bitcoin will be the sound money base layer nobody's paying with bitcoin that i think dream is done uh because you don't want to pay with something that actually accrues value over time but the dollar will be a, a, a payment currency and a payment rails. And I think in the long run, we're going to have a basket of call it dollar, dollar euro, the Chinese yuan, some sort of Bitcoin based, you know, basket. There'll be five or six global currencies. And, and like Joey said, when you're looking at smaller countries that are either have major currency fluctuations and or are dollarized or have the debt you know in dollars but their currency is, is just fluctuating are just will ultimately move over to a bitcoin or some sort of commodity based basket mm -hmm. and or a combination uh, of those things i again i again so i jasper i agree they will eat the dollar but these guys no no, like, no 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 I'm, I'm just saying that if you don't have an alternative yeah. because right now you can read all the report from all the big banks saying hey the dollar position is not uh, in risk um, because there is no better fiat currency. But just like, uh, you know, uh, Blockbuster wasn't outbeated by another chain, they were outbeated by Netflix. And just like Kodak wasn't, you know, thrown out of the game by another producer of cameras, but by the phone. Um, it's the same that the disruption will come from another arena. So, uh, and that will be the blockchain arena, not, not necessarily the Bitcoin arena, but from the blockchain arena. And so, so I see that, that the blockchain systems and the ecosystems we are building, uh, w without doubt, will outbeat them. It's just a matter of time. Right. right. And transitioning now into, we've been speaking about institutions and the rails in place and legislation governing bodies. Uh, but so I think a lot of the viewers would like to know in between like the irony that we've spoken about, about kind of controlling what's going on and accessibility, how will this actually benefit the average everyday retail investor? Um, Alex, did you want to start with that one? Uh, sure. I Look, I, I think th the more we move it into a mainstream finance, ETF is a great example of it. The more I think it will just increase adoption with with average retails. Um, hmm. I think I think their their time will come. I you know if I can just pivot for a second, the one scenario I'm a little bit nervous about is just coming seeing it from a little bit of a policy perspective. Is you know we have a big run up, and when the RIAs tell the average Joe and Jane Main Street you know, uh, invest and we put people's retirements in this in, in Bitcoin and we have a fall afterwards, which we probably will. I mean, everyone needs to be baptized by fire, but no coiners and normies. It's, 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 it's a rough ride, right? When you're seeing your portfolio go down by 70%. Sure. When that happens and they call the congressmen and senators and say, Hey, this thing was a Ponzi. Why didn't you do more to protect me? And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, I'm a little bit nervous about that situation, right? Because people are going to get in the ETF without understanding Bitcoin. To date, we've had people in Bitcoin who believe. Uh, and you're in crypto, it's hard. There, there's friction points, so it's self-selection. You believe in the space. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous about that situation. And that's actually one way the major players can, quote unquote, I don't know if they can kill it. They're not going to be able to kill the industry, but they can put a lot of pressure on it, write it up dump it hard and then put political pressure to either effectively kill it by just putting you know a lot of rules and regulations in place and so i think it's incumbent upon all of us to 
bring in this next wave very carefully, very diligently. Um, and not so much for the, you know, very mature CEOs that we have on this call here, but when we look outside and all the influencers and all the, there's a lot of garbage in the space, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, getting rid of all of that and making sure that people are in and they understand what they're getting into, I think is going to be very, very critical that, that this next wave down, that could be a, you know, a, a very hidden wave that we're not quite prepared for. Right. A lot of, let me let me just drop a, uh, a comment Very here. Quickly, though, Jesse, I'm, I'm really looking forward to <laughs> when people from my network call me and say, "Yes, but how do I get some bitcoins?" <laughs> and I can say, "Just call your bank," you know, uh, right. because and and just like Brooks said, he said, you know, you call before you walk and you walk before you run. And I actually think you know it will make a lot of people buy a very small portion and get interested in it, learn about it. Then one day they maybe will get a you know uh, their own wallet, and then they will start using it. So it's 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 a process, but mm. um, yeah. It, yeah. it's definitely positive. It, it, it'll also put price pressure on on. I mean, at the moment, buying an ETF and uh, BTC ETF and paying whatever it is thirty basis points as a management fee is cheaper than buying BTC directly through some exchange platforms when you start factoring the spreads and the margins, etc. So that's going to put price pressure on those exchanges to do things differently. And then it'll be attractive to like, you know, certain secure, easy retail markets. But then from the Bitcoin community, from the purists, um, you're you're not acquiring the asset directly. So I think some people will will hold on to that i mean with i mean you know through zappa you're buying your btc through an etf you're you're exposing yourself to the price right so and those are two yeah. slightly different things and with yeah, that we're, we're actually at time gentlemen it has been such an honor to have all of you here uh it's always a little bit more of a rush conversation on video versus doing it on our spaces to everyone listening uh come on and listen to the benzinga spaces i'm sure i'll have all of these these people back this has been such a great discussion. I really appreciate you all taking the time to share your thoughts. And Alex, I, I, I love and, and even covet your uh, neon Bitcoin sign. <laughs> this, is, this is how we do it at the chamber. All Bitcoin all the time. <laughs> all right. Thank you, guys. It's been fantastic having you on. Thank you so much. Thanks, for your guys. Time. Thank you. Ciao. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. And Megan, you've been a fantastic. I guess we'll just. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not usually I'm logged in so I could change it myself, but um, you've been, thank you so much for coming on and, and, and being co-host with me uh, today. We should definitely do this again. You've Absolutely. been great. You, you have any uh, final words for us as we close up the show? I mean, nothing. just thanks for coming and bringing the most relevant conversations in crypto to the forefront to give the audience, you know, the latest on what's going on and these insightful conversations to hopefully pave the way for the foundational building blocks of the future of the Internet. Justin, it's all happening here. So it's super exciting. I, I was am always impressed at the highly intelligent people that will take time out of their day to, to come and speak with me. <laughs> I'm always flattered by it. Um, and I appreciate you you taking the time. Uh, what a great panel. What what a, what great keynotes. We're going to wrap it up here because we are at time, folks. But, Megan, it's been a delight. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I, I hope that we, you have a great day. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter, follow us on YouTube, and we'll keep bringing more uh, great content at you. All right, everyone. Peace.